All right. Um, hi, my name is Dylan Long. Um, hopefully you won't be getting too much um, wind interference from outside. Um, rest, the house is pretty much shaking right now because of all the wind and the storms, but we're still going to soldier on through this. Okay. This is um, my SAL 630 Legal Aspects in Sports presentation. Um, this is my case brief number two. Um, for this brief, I decided to go with the O'Banion versus the NCAA. Now moving on to the questions. Okay, so number one, the case information. Uh, the case name, uh, the court that decided it, the date that it was decided, the parties involved, the plaintiff and defendant. Okay, so case name, uh, O'Banion versus NCAA, I think it's case number 802. Okay, and then um, court that decided the, the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit um, date decided, uh, this was decided uh, September 30th, 2015. Okay, parties involved. Okay, so the plaintiff for this case is um, Edward Charles O'Banion Jr., otherwise known as Ed O'Banion. But this uh, changed throughout the case. There was more plaintiffs that were added. Um, I couldn't find a complete list of uh, the names that were added, but I knew that, know that there was more that was added to this case. Um, the defendant in this is the um, National Collegiate Athletic Association, the NCAA, and the uh, Collegiate Licensing Company. Okay, so moving on to number two. Okay, so the facts. Uh, so summarize the relevant facts that led to the legal dispute. Focus on what happened and who did what and circumstances involved. Okay, try and keep this uh, somewhat brief. Um, so Ed O'Banion, our plaintiff, um, he was your typical uh, star athlete um, in college. Um, he was a starting basketball player for UCLA. Um, he was more well known uh, for being a starter in the uh, 1995 national championship team. And he was um, also named the NCAA most outstanding player for that year. Um, but uh, some things kind of changed for him uh, later, you know, well actually a few years later, but in 2009 to be exact. Um, O'Banion filed a lawsuit against the NCAA and the uh, collegiate licensing company. The case brought forth uh, was to challenge the NCAA's rules prohibiting college athletes from receiving compensation for their use of their names, image, and likeness, so NIL like we've seen today. So this applied for broadcast, video games, and other commercial venues, which is why this was brought up, is because he saw his uh, name, image, and likeness being used in a NCAA basketball video game. So the law lawsuit argued that the NCAA practices violated antitrust laws by preventing athletes from sharing or from sharing in the uh, profits generated from their own name, image, and likeness, um, which was at the time was EA Sports, which was one of the defendants um, that was later added to the case. Um, they were the ones that ended up producing the college um, basketball video game that included the virtual I mean, descriptions and depictions of, of what he actually looked like in, uh, in real life. And that was O'Banion. So like I talked about in the first uh, segment there, um, I also wanted to add that there were 20 other plaintiffs that were added to the case um, for the uh, incident or for that name engine and likeness. Um, uh, these athletes were they were considered current and former student athletes. Um, some of the names that were being mentioned um, were like um, pretty relevant um, basketball stars, um, Oscar Robinson and Bill Russell, but apparently they weren't just basketball. It spanned also into um, football as well. So the NCAA had, um, been, had been using the court case of NCAA versus Board of uh, Regents of the University of Oklahoma. Sorry if I said that wrong. 
um, stating that pretty much this kept them from being scrutinized in antitrust laws because of the amateurism rules that the NCAA had at that time. Okay, so number three, um, what is the legal issue at hand? Um, uh, what a what point of law was being depicted or determined? So, excuse me. So O'Banion sued the NCAA for alleged violations of the Sherman Antitrust Act, which was actually covered in my first case brief. Um, and uh, the actions that deprived him of the rights of his um, name, image, and likeness. That was pretty much what, I guess, the conflict was in this case. So, number four, um, the rule of law. Um, identify and summarize the relevant legal principles that applies, um, for an example, a statute, um, precedent, or legal doctrine. Okay, so in this case, the legal pre um, principle being brought to question is the Sherman Antitrust Act. Um, the, the thing is that um, there's no, there was no, or at least in the court, um, from what I read, it's the, they didn't use a previous case um, to help them decide this decision. This was kind of like what the court just kind of decided on their own from, I guess, from, from hearing and uh, reading about this um, in this case. Um, so, Moving on to number five, the application. Um, explain how the rule of law was applied to the facts of this case and describe how the courts analyze the facts based upon the law. Okay, so the court simply decided that uh, the NCAA, they, they weren't immune to antitrust laws because of their amateurism rules they had in place because um, the one case that they had been using. They, I guess the NCAA just, they thought they were immune to antitrust laws. I'm not real sure why. Um, in O'Banion versus the NCAA, the, the, the plaintiffs, they argued that the NCAA rules, they prohibited um, compensation for athletes and this, this violated NILs. So it was, this, this, these antitrust laws, this was preventing athletes. They were from seeing, receiving any kind of compensation for their, for their name, image, and likeness. So, so in other words, the video games that they were being put into. Um, so they argued that these antitrust laws were, so that which they were designed to promote fair competition and prevent monopolistic practices. Practices. So, the court examined whether the NCAA's rules regarding athlete compensation constituted a unreasonable constraint um, or an unreasonable restraint of the trade, uh, trade under antitrust laws. Okay. Okay, so the court decided that the um, restrictions weren't necessarily to achieve a a pure competition purposes, which is this is what the the NCAA were claiming to be to be under um, in this. Um, so pretty much they, they were they were kind of working off nothing is what the NCAA they were they were just trying to throw in their own rules and pretty much just claim a bunch of different things in this. So in conclusion, what was the final ru ruling and summarize the court's de decision and reasoning. Um, in August 2014, the federal court ruled in favor of O'Banion and ruled that the NCAA's rules on athlete compensation were in violation of antitrust laws. However, the court also did have this have this snippet in there as well. Um, they also ruled that athletes could not could only could only receive compensation up to the full cost of attending college and not for any additional amounts. The ruling was later upheld on appeal, but the case had significant implications for future athletics and and the issues of athlete compensation. This has ended up being a huge hit to the NCAA's amateurism rules in college sports, 
uh, and the rights for athletes to profit from their own NIL, and which is what we've actually seen today, um, or not even today, just the last couple of years with NIL. So it's this court or this case has become very relevant nowadays. Um, and this actually concludes um, my case brief number two. I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you.